mach nichts, dann machen wir das so. Wie heißt es? Wie Die anderen finden es nicht vielleicht. Start maybe yeah, my dear friends. Maybe we should start, and I I begin with the introduction. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session about data use and sovereignty, data sovereignty, in the framework of the I Internet Governance Forum today. Before we dive into the discussion, here in my text is um, 60 minutes, but unfortunately we only have 30 minutes, so we really have to rush through everything. I'm Steffi Czerny. I founded 2005 a conference called DLD. DLD stands for Digital Life Design, and it deals with how is the internet shaping our world and our society and our personal lives. It's an honor for me to moderate here today. We have a distinguished group, group of people from different geographies as well as backgrounds in this session. One of the fathers of the internet, Vint Cerf. Four ministers, in the moment only two ministers, but we hope there will be more. Four ministers of government from Asia, Africa and Europe. One high-ranking UN representative, one advisory member, board member of globally operating companies, and one representative from a non-profit organization. Unfortunately, the announced Mr. Müller, Tarek Müller, couldn't come. He got ill tonight, so I'm the one who do the introduction. So allow me to lead into the topic briefly before we go into the individual statements of each panelist and the following Q&A session. Here we are more now. Many of the globally operating digital services we are all using, or should I say, we all are relying on today are based on a key resource, which as you know, data machine generated data, and more importantly, human generated data such as location, medical or behavioral data. Around this human generated or personal data, there has been much debate on how it can and should be processed in order to further economic development, efficient governmental processes and research while protecting the individual's rights for their privacy. Calls for data sovereignty and data regulation have been raised especially from European governments and consumers. While on the other hand, the argument can be made that the full potential, the full potential of the internet can only be harvested when it remains open, free and borderless. And data can flow freely. 
What makes data governance in the global space of the internet a particular challenge in the fact is the fact that there is a different understanding of data who belongs to different regions of, to, of the world. Thus, the data belongs to the companies which collected to build businesses and services out of it. Thus, it belongs to the state government which can use it to further the um, technologically, te technological impact in development of the nation? Or does it belong to the individual which has a right to make an informed decision where and when their data should be used? How can we reach an agreement on what good, good data governance is in this respect? I think we all can agree that it's a necessary and important task to define these rules if we want to enhance trust in the internet while fostering growth and development of digital data-driven businesses and research. So let's jump into the, the panelists' discussion. I would like to turn to you, Wint. Wint Surf, you are one of the fathers of the internet and also vice president and chief evangelist for Google. And an essay from 2013, co-authored by yourself, is titled Internet Governance is Our Shared Responsibility, which makes a case for existing multiple internet stakeholders to push forward governance initiatives in three areas of expertise, in their areas of expertise, rather than pursuing a one regulation fits all approach. Is dispersing responsibility the way forward? And how far are we in the process of governing the use of data? So I hope that in fact it is the way forward because uh, the ability to move data freely from one place to another in the world over this uh, world-spanning internet uh, does require a lot of cooperation and assumed responsibility among all of us. We have to have both technical protections and we have to have common principles that will allow people who put data into this system to feel uh, that the data is properly protected and that they can trust the organizations, Google and others, uh, to maintain uh, safety and uh, the security of that information. The GDPR is an attempt to uh, both uh, to sort of um, standardize uh, the way in which we treat data, but uh, it's essential that there be accountability for uh, the safety of that information. So this, from the Google point of view, we're very experienced with enormous amounts of data that people trust us to put into the system and maintain access to uh, only authorized parties. Uh, it's your email, it's your documents, uh, it's your Google searches, it's your maps and all the other things that, uh, that we offer uh, are protected and we do that uh, recognizing that in order to trust us with the data, we have to apply uh, extremely powerful uh, mechanisms, including cryptography, uh, to protect data in transit and also at rest. So one of the things that I think we have to collectively achieve, achieve if we, we want, want all, all of the organizations, organizations uh, who, are who are part of, part of the, the internet, internet to freely, freely move data, data around, around is to have adopted, adopted common, common principles, principles, technical, technical principles, principles. Uh, in, in order, order to, to assure, assure everyone, everyone that the data, data is adequately protected, that, that there is strong authentication of parties, parties before, before they, they get access, access to the data, and that, and that those who own the data, data are confident, confident that, it's that it's being treated, treated in accordance, in accordance with, their with their expectations. I will, I will mention that, that uh, we've established a Google Safety, Safety Engineering, Engineering Center in Munich, and that, and that group, group wishes, wishes to engage with others, with others in order to formulate uh, practices, practices and, policies and policies and principles for protection of information as it flows through the, through the internet. internet. I'll, I'll stop, stop there, there Madam, Madam Chairman, Chairman because, because I know you have, have very, very little time. time. Thank you, Thank you Wind, Wind, sir. This, this was, was the perspective, perspective of, the, of, a, of, a, the, of a U.S. US company. company. I'd, I'd like, like now to, 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 to ask Nadia, Nadia uh, Calvino, Minister, Minister of, of Economy, Economy of Spain. Spain. Dear, Dear Minister, Minister, you have also, also had, had a long-standing experience as Director General of the, of the Directorate, Directorate General Budget in the European Commission. What is, from your European point of view, the reaction on that, what Wind just said? 
Well, I was very happy to hear actually this uh, very constructive approach. Before I was responsible for the budget in the, in the EU Commission, I was responsible also for financial regulation and competition. And I think that um, this is an area where technology has evolved very fast. And now we need to adjust all our different institutions and our systems and our legal frameworks. And I was very encouraged uh, in the course of this morning already to hear that we, there is this very strong consensus that probably self-regulation is not enough and we need to find a way to regulate things in a constructive manner, in a coherent manner throughout the world to build global standards, to build global governance frameworks. And I was, I was happy to hear that the business uh, sector, which, which is most directly impacted by this, is also seeing this need and happy to, to find a way forward. And when it comes to data, I don't, we don't need to spend any time discussing the importance uh, that they have. I think that there are three key issues we need to reflect upon. The first one is accessibility, not only the free flow, but how do we ensure that we take the opportunities of accessing this data to improve health services? This has been mentioned as a, as a very good example in, in the course of the morning. While, of course, ensuring the integrity, the correctness of the data, the maintenance of those data, and the privacy and the uh, non-individualization of the data. No? And this is a first key issue, accessibility. But it is undoubtedly connected to the second issue, which is trust. If there is no trust in that the data is going to be appropriately used by the private sector and by the public sector, and then citizens are not going to be willing to give their data, and so we will lose these opportunities. I think in that sense, the general data protection regulation, the GDPR, uh, becoming a sort of a standard throughout the, the world is, is a very good uh, development because it will avoid that we end up having so uh, hundreds of different rules which at the end of the day are not going to enable us to know what's going on with our data. This second issue, trust, is, is uh, indispensable. And then the third issue, which is also the big elephant in the room, but it has been mentioned uh, already this morning, is who owns the data? Citizens own data. Companies that develop this these, uh, know-how own the data. And so what is the value of these data? And how do we have a fair taxation system? In that sense also, I think it's very important that we make progress in the OECD and in the G20 framework so that we are building also economic uh, uh, governance systems which enable this development of the new technologies across the world in a manner which protects or puts the citizen at the center of the development so that we profit from the opportunities, but we avoid the mistakes and the risks which we are already starting to see. We spoke very briefly about this panel, and you mentioned immediately trust as one of the most important source of dealing with the internet. Can you give us your point of view, please? Okay, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm very sorry to be late because I was in the wrong room and I uh, sat in the uh, the stage, and I was so much embarrassed. <laughs> and, uh, so my colleague took me here, and I uh, so I'm very happy to be here on uh, in time. And uh, so, um, so we, we Japan uh, uh, was the uh, chair of the G20 meeting this year, and uh, that meeting focused on the uh, data free flow. But uh, we uh, so had the consensus on the data free flow with trust, and it is the the uh, G20 uh, uh, government's consensus that the free flow of data is important, but the trust is necessary for the future uh, data flow. And uh, so uh, I'd like to introduce here uh, our initiative, Japanese initiative on the, uh, one of the example uh, of the, uh, how to uh, reach the, uh, the situation of the trust of data uh, flow. Uh, it is uh, concerned with the personal data, a personal data bank. And uh, so there are many consumers who have uh, anxiety over providing personal data. And uh, in order to resolve these anxieties, it is critical, the important to let individual to be involved in the use of personal data. We need to balance uh, controllability by individuals and data usage. And in regards to this, 
Uh, I'd like to introduce a Japanese framework called Personal Data Trust Bank, and which enables data use with the involvement of individuals. And uh, this scheme enables individuals to store and manage their personal data. Uh, however, it is difficult for people to make decisions on the use of their individual data. And in addition, each person has difficulties thinking about the purpose of the use of data. So uh, Personal Data Trust Bank is a framework to solve those issues. And uh, this scheme enables individuals to delegate interested parties to provide personal data to third parties with consensus. And so if, uh, and I understand this panel is very much time limited. <laughs> so if I have time more, and then I, will, I can uh, so, um, explain a little bit more, but uh, this is a kind of the introduction uh, uh, remarks uh, from me uh, uh, concerning the trust. Thank you so much. I think it's really for us, the audience and the listeners, really important to learn more about the amazing things which are going on in Japan. I think I had no idea how advanced your policy is. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, as next panelist, as next minister of state, I, I really like to um, hear from Minister Ebrima Silla, Minister of Information and Communications in Gambia now. As we heard from Fatumata Ba, many African starts, states are quickly leapfrogging into the global digital economy. So what is your position on data governance in this growing market? Should it be left to the economy or to the government? Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and I think um, the time given to us is too short to you know, actually lay out our strategic policy interventions, but uh, I think your, your question and of course uh, the issue of um, data governance bring to fore an important fundamental issue for us in Africa, which is uh, data security and data integrity, and also trusting the trustee. Because let me tell you that, I mean, uh, within the next 20, 30 years, I mean, you will have more internet users in Africa than Europe, America combined with the way the trends are going. And what a lot of companies are looking at basically is to what we call segregate the populations into classes. I mean, uh, the middle class, the affordable class, and also the extreme poor, but who will have important data that uh, the NGOs and also multilaterals will have to use to justify a whole lot of interventions in Africa. And for us, this is extremely important that uh, data sovereignty lies in the states so that companies that are coming in to work with uh, our governments, our citizens, ensure that uh, the rules are respected, the rules are followed, and then we have a fundamental right to accessing that data with respect, but with also responsibility. Now, our, so far, our global convergence is around the Budapest Convention on Cybersecurity and all those issues, but we also have some great concerns about who use our data, what do they use it for, because right now, you, you know, we, need to, we have to admit this. People of African descent and people of Africa and African countries are people who are being tracked most for you know, data miners, you know, for what we call opportunistic use of uh, this data in future. So it is extremely important for us that uh, we lay the foundations through policy, but also through legislation, that data that is collected by our people, our unsuspecting people, are managed by the state because it is a conventional wisdom that the state acts on behalf of the people and it acts in good faith on behalf of those people. So really for us, I mean, uh, it is too short to you know, lay out our fundamental policy concerns, but you know, I mean, uh, we, we have already developed a paper that I will share with uh, the, the, especially those of the countries that are from the developing world, not only from Africa, to put some of these fundamental issues into great, great, great consideration while we move together to ensure that uh, we have a fully digital governance environment that acts with caution, but also with responsibility. Thank you. Thank you for your optimistic and um, I vision. And I'm, I'm very glad that you told us this. I think this panel could be held for a whole conference. 30 minutes are definitely too short. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a, such a pity. Um, for the next
next statement, I would like to hear from Mr. Liu Zemin, the Under Secretary General um, of the United Nations. I mean, you are at the center, the center, the very center of um, of all of all of the global um, data governance debate. You are also a national of China. Do you see the conflict line between China and Europe and the US when it comes to data use and privacy as clearly cut as it open, often reported? Thank you, thank you, Madhuri. I think uh, this is a very challenging question to me. Let me share with you the, some perspective about how we see the data issue in the United Nations. Actually, you know, internet really changing the data generation, changing the data possession, changing the data use. Uh, uh, until internet was developed, actually, the data for the whole international community were all rely on official, so-called official data, official statistics. But uh, with, with the development of the internet, actually the generation of data being at a much wider scope that every citizen has now become the owner of the data. But that's a raised a lot of problem, that be how we could really balance the interest between official data and non-official data, and how to ensure that be, that be really the non-official data really be complementary and contributive to the integration of the official data. That be lay a good foundation for the future development of the internet. I think be for, for the United Nations, uh, we have a confronted challenge that be since 2015, when the world leaders adopted the 2030 agenda. There to be, of course, agenda until 2030. Maybe how we could support in governments, member states, and all community to ensure that be, they have the adequate data for preparing their development, as well as to measurement their progress. This is a big challenge. I think that be, though we're trying to use the official data because the official data is much trusted by governments, much trusted by governments. But in many cases, that be insufficient disequity data is a big challenge that be, because even official data, that be, there are also gaps between member states depending on their, their, their capacity for, for development and generating data. You, you, you mentioned be, what about the, the gap between EU, US, and China. Actually, I think that be, these countries, they are in a better position for official data. They are in a better position for both generation and processing. But within among 193 your member states, there be data gap exists very seriously between the north and the south. I think until now, as the Minister of Gambia mentioned, we do not have the universal access of data capacity among 193 members. So that's the issue we, we want to try to achieve, that be, to have, have, have every country have the national capacity for develop official data. This is basis. Second, I think based on official data, how we could help improve the processing of the non-official data. This is a single internet really would be of great help. I think we need to cooperate with different internet society, internet companies, that be, they could be help to, be, to improve our quality of data. By improving the quality of data, I think they improve the authority of data. So that I think be, uh, you know, data, the Minister of Spain has mentioned be, it's a trust of data, this is a big issue. I think to improve the trust of data, we, we have to base, start by improving the quality of data, and they the big trust it. Of course, I think that be, this be data would be a basis for f f further development, further evolution of the internet. But I, I hope it be for all the internet companies, really devote more investment in helping the international community improve the data. 
I think this can be done through the collaboration with some governments, as well as through cooperation with some international organizations. I think United Nations really in a position to, to collaborate with internet societies, with in, in internet companies to improve that be, that be our data would, would be improved. Well, I think I'm confident in that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your call to action. Um, now, Pablo, you're, please give us your perspective. Pablo, you are with AP and IC. Uh, maybe you give us a short glimpse what is it and what your role is there and how you see the question of international trust in data regarding localization of the internet. So it's a very flash panel and a very lightning talk. I wanted to bring uh, here a perspective of phenomenon that is happening on the internet, which is the localized content um, on the internet. And I, I will um, depart from what Vin said, that uh, people basically put a lot of trust to put their data uh, to organizations, certain organizations which are called uh, the, 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 the uh, cloud com computer uh, uh, companies and the c content um, distributors. Um, so this has created uh, sort of a, a change in, in, in the way sort of the, the internet works uh, in, in the sense that um, it also enables uh, national interests around cyber sovereignty and, and more control and regulation over, over data. Um, since today most of the traffic goes from a content owner um, straight to the cloud provider and, and, and there are um, sort of a concentrated group of, 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 of companies that deliver this, com this content. Uh, this content can be local or global uh, to, to the final users. Um, so the traffic flow, instead of going through the public internet, is, is now bouncing between sort of the, these networks uh, uh, before it goes straight to the local networks. So I wanted to, to, to bring sort of the, the questions of localized content into this discussion because I think they are at the core of um, self-determination of data and also um, um, data sovereignty as, as the, the question for this panel um, uh, posed. Thank you, Pablo Hinoza. Is it the idea of think global and act local? Maybe it's, it's an old-fashioned quote, but it still works. So now I have the pleasure to um, ask you, my dear friend Simone. You, we know each for a long time, and I'm happy that you're here. You are an influential businesswoman here in Germany. You work with several boards. You are uh, advisory committee board member. And you have a good insight of the state of the internet and digitalization in the world because you work with global companies. You just heard from six different panelists, six different statements. What is your point of view regarding our Topic. That's a slightly unfair position I'm in now because uh, I I'm the last and I have nearly the last word. Um, so let's put it like this. Uh, data, and I think we all agree, is an absolutely valuable resource and we need it for the human mankind and further development. And therefore we need it globally for health, for distribution of goods. Um, what we see at the moment is already a separation of internet. So we see some localized internets, different rules in different countries uh, that may hinder our global further development uh, of, of data. So to solve the problems of mankind, we need a global cooperation beyond borders and industries. And therefore I think this forum here is just great because it brings together politics, companies, and uh, scientists knowing what, what we can do as well as industries. United Nations is, I think, the, the owner, the task holder for this. But slightly controversial to what I've heard before, I think trust globally is already lost. Uh, there has, to be, has been too many misuses of data by companies as well as by nations. And uh, what we need, I think, is first a lot more transparency to the individual, 
meaning what are algorithms doing in Google or in a BMW. Um, we need ownership for the individual. I don't believe that a company or a nation can own the data of an individual. Unfortunately, at the moment, we have a technology where you have to hand over your data to get some convenience or sometimes even something you, you urgently need. So therefore, I think and I hope that uh, a solution like Tim Berners-Lee is, is providing, where we have a social link and individual ownership of data where you decide on your own what to do with it, could be a solution here. I don't see national solutions. I think we need a lot more training for everybody to understand what we are doing with our data. And we, of course, and we all agree on that, need a code of conduct with responsibility for every player, meaning the individual, the company, as well as a nation, has to sign a code of conduct which is borderless with common rules and where misuse by individual, company, or nations is a crime like any other crime and will therefore, uh, like any crime against human mankind, be uh, uh, punished. So that's my idea. Thank you, Simone. I, um, I think we need a, really, we need a kind of an enlightenment. Um, what was in the 18th century um, happening, the free, free the demo democracy of, um, states, we need this. We need. To, we have to. Uh, we have to get involved much more than we are. Um, since we owe the the fact of the internet, our dear friend Vince Cerf, who was is still one of the fathers of the internet, I'll give you the last word. Well, thank what, you. How did you react? What you just heard? Thank you so much for that. I, I wanted to point out something to you that not all data should necessarily be owned. Some of the most valuable data in the world is public data, is shared data, and we use it to advance scientific knowledge. We use it to make major decisions and policy decisions. However, even if it's not owned, it's important that it have integrity and that we understand the provenance of the data. So part of our challenge is to make sure that we can achieve that objective. Uh, if we know about open source, think about open data in the same uh, context. We also need to develop ontologies that help us describe the kind of data that we're dealing with, whether it's official data that you mentioned earlier, uh, or uh, personal data, or protected data of one kind or another. We need the ontologies so that we can tell people how we are treating the data based on its type. So I just leave that uh, for you to consider that let us not imagine that all data has to be owned, that shared data, public data is vitally important. Thank you so much. Thank you for dear panelists. I'm so sorry that we can't open it for questions. We are over, already have 30 minutes and this is over now, but I encourage you to continue. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, 38 seconds. One question from the audience. Here. Please introduce you and just give us here. Uh, Horst Kremers, Codeta Germany. I very much appreciate that there was at, le at least in the last uh, uh, panelist. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having a little bit criticism or skepticism uh, about our societies. What the reality is, you can wish all the trust you want, and the reality is that it doesn't work. And uh, for instance, one question for me raised here uh, was uh, in direction of United Nations. How is the effort, the realistic effort of United Nations to fight corruption internationally? Corruption doesn't work without information. And we all know that corruption is about big money and those people need the information from the others. That is, corruption is part of the, the internet fighting. So, uh, what is the realistic perspective of United Nations? Thank you so much for your question. I think it gives us food for thought. We can't answer it yet now because it ta would take too much time. But um, I invite you to come to the DLD conference. It's a little self shameless self promotion. It's in January 18th to the 20th. Please apply to come, and I encourage the panel to continue at DLD. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Hello. I think we'll get started in two minutes. So if we could get the panelists on stage and other participants in the room, please. Hello everyone and um, welcome to this uh, highly uh, relevant panel on data-driven uh, business uh, models. I will not make a long introduction because we've already lost a lot of time. This panel has gone from 60 to 50 to now 40 minutes. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, no, fortunately, there's not been a reduction in the number of panelists. <laughs> so so we're, we're, we're still nine panelists with, uh, with about uh, 40 minutes uh, to share. Uh, we all know the importance of the subject. I'm not going to go on about that. Uh, data really is the, uh, the oil of this uh, century. But we have a lot of questions that we need to discuss. How are we going to leverage data? How are we going to measure the value of data? Uh, data is not homogenous. There is personal and non-personal data. There's public, non-public data. There's user and machine-derived uh, data. So we need to discuss uh, how we're going to uh, leverage uh, data uh, in, uh, in, in the future. We've done uh, a lot of work in the OECD and embarking on new work on now to, uh, how to enhance access uh, to data. That is why we take a particular interest uh, as part of our going uh, digital project, which is the biggest horizontal project uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the OECD. Uh, it's going to work this way. I'm going to give all of nine of our panelists the floor to say whatever they want about the subject. I'm not sure we're going to have time for a Q&A. We will try to see if we can. Um, I have a, a, a method to discipline you uh, that the public doesn't know about, but there is a watch here to limit you to the three minutes. I can see it, you can see it, but you can't see it, but, but that, that is meant to discipline us. So you all have three minutes, uh, except uh, you, uh, uh, Martin, you will kick us off. Uh, you have uh, five uh, minutes. Um, Martin is the... Uh, uh, Martin is the founder of Bolt and also an entrepreneur for 20 years. You've started uh, six uh, companies and you're also the co-founder of the Estonian Education Foundation. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Okay, hello. Uh, great to be here today. Um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll try to give a quick overview of how we see uh, urban transportation and how data is, is relevant to, to our business model. So then... Um, Bolt uh, is the uh, third fastest growing company in Europe based on uh, Financial Times. Uh, we operate in 34 markets. We operate ride hailing, uh, micro mobility, electric scooters, uh, motorcycle taxis, and now recently also food delivery. And uh, yeah, we have been growing really fast. We are a six year old company and one of the European challengers and unicorns. Um, then, uh, um, how much we actually use uh, and then gather data. So we do about 1 million rides per day. So that means that we get hundreds of gigabytes of valuable data all the time. And when talking about AI, then we currently have 300 AI models in production uh, currently. And that's not just developing the models, but that also means that uh, we need to monitor them to make sure that uh, they make sense, they add value, and so on. Um, then, uh, what are the use cases where we actually use data and, and also uh, data science and, and machine learning? So, uh, as in ride hailing, uh, you probably know that pricing is really important. So, passengers always want a cheaper price, the drivers always want to have higher price. How do we find a reasonable balance in between them to make sure that we have enough drivers to cover the, the need? and the price is uh, cheap enough so that drivers would be willing to come out. So this is one of the, the main things. We, we use data and try to predict um, what kind of pricing logic we should, we should provide. 
Second is about campaigns. So, uh, for example, recently we, we launched in London and uh, we, uh, we invested millions per month. So how we make sure that all the campaign uh, money is exactly targeted to people that, uh, that we get the best return out of it. So uh, we need to subsidize drivers to bring them online. We need to give discounts to passengers how exactly what patterns is, is needed to, to get the best results. So this is what we do in pricing side. Uh, then uh, maps and ETAs, you probably all of know that ETA of, of these apps are, are challenging. Sometimes they go wrong because the city traffic is very difficult to predict. So we have now last two years built the mapping layer in-house. Before that, we were, we were based on Google Maps, but now we also use OpenStreetMaps. We use our own data from the rights, and we try to calculate the best possible ETA to make sure that uh, we can tell you when the car actually arrives. So th those are maybe the three main areas where we where we use um, use data data science. Um, a few principles: that we always want to be ethical, so we don't want to use uh, data. For example, we know that the passenger is ordering a car; they have an expensive latest iPhone model, and their battery is about to die. Quite a good uh, situation where to put high prices, but we don't want to do that, and all our uh, majority of our AI decisions are actually based on aggregated data, not about single person. Few example or few exceptions here is when we need to deal with fraud prevention or uh, some law enforcement situations. Then we actually need to uh, consider specific users. And of course, we need to take very much care about the data. Everyone's accessing private data is logged and, and only per need basis. And uh, then lately. We have lots of regulations coming up, uh, GDPR, uh, but also uh, the AI ethics and, and different frameworks that we are, we are monitoring on. So we try to always follow the regulations and best practices. And uh, then what challenges we, we see ahead? So um, for our case, um, operating in cities, then many and more and more cities are asking data from the platforms. So, so the challenge for us is that uh, APIs are very different, the data, how they ask it, what they ask is very different. So we would be happy if there would be some kind of best practice globally, so we could have one API and share it with all. But on the second, the challenge is what data to share, because data is also a competitive advantage for platforms. And uh, cities often ask too much data, which they might even not use. So we, we need to find a very balanced situation, what to share in order not to lose competitive advantage, but on the other hand, then gain um, data that cities need for planning the transport and so on. And secondly, we see that uh, overall global data literacy level for people is relevantly low. We have all these sophisticated discussions about AI, the data and so on, but most people don't even understand that. So we need to raise and educate people. And there is a one very good Finnish initiatives. It's a free online course, 15 hours elements of AI. And Finland claims that 2% of their population have already passed it. I think that many other nations could take that lead and then try to educate their people so we actually have relevant and, and reasonable discussions. And finally, I mentioned already regulations. That's a challenge everywhere. So how to find a, a decent balance for that. So um, thank you. That was very shortly from Bolt. And uh, by the way, all our rides in Europe are carbon neutral. So we also try to be a sustainable platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And you even did it in four minutes. That shows you the efficiency of the private sector. So you saved us one minute. I, I'd like to now turn to uh, you, Dr. Uh, Dirk uh, Abendroth. Uh, you uh, are uh, you're the chief technology officer of uh, Continental uh, Automotive and also an award-winning expert in the development of systems for automated driving, connected mobility, and electric uh, vehicle drivers. Uh, Dirk, you have the floor. Yeah, just reflecting on a couple of um, critical principles we uh, think are the key ones to finally make business happen and make us feel comfortable with this. Um, I think one of the key things, first of all, is that we um, agree upon a uh, underlying principle, which is very simply speaking, which okay, as I mentioned that earlier in this keynote, uh, we are under control of our data. That applies to us as human beings, our personal data, on the one hand side, and secondly, as he mentioned as well, uh, to IP. So IP is to a certain degree data as well, and it's something we need to be under control. Otherwise, no business is possible, as you mentioned earlier. So that is kind of the 
to my understanding, underlying principle, otherwise it can't work. Once this is uh, in place and you are under control of your data, then the second step is very kind of straightforward. Then it needs trust to give your data to somebody else. So and this trust is something you need to earn one by one or you need to have at least some of an initial trust and then see this trust is proven to, to be right. So in the end, it needs kind of very clear kind of regulations in the sense like, how do I, for example, give away my IP and get recharged back? How can I have control of my personal data and make sure it is not kind of you know, misused, etc.? So these are kind of the two steps which are kind of, I think, straightforward. When it comes to the very special and, and, and dedicated business uh, I'm in automotive uh, and mobility, then I think there's um, three uh, say basic notions I'd like to mention here. One is um, classification. So to us, it's very, very important what kind of data we're looking at. Just give you um, kind of a couple of examples. One is, for example, you just collect traces. Or another thing might be you ask people and the quality, say the, the quality and the kind of, of what you get back, the samples are totally different. That, which is kind of related to the second aspect, which is what I call qualification. So qualification is something like, well, you could simply kind of translate that to quality. What's the quality of data I get? So for example, is it a re representative sample? Is it something which represents the European Union or African people or the entire world or just a city or whatever? Is that a rep representative uh, sample? Or is it maybe something which even qualifies, for example, to get a certain homologation? For, for example, to get something proven to be safety uh, relevant or even safe? So these kind of, for example, traces, once they are kind of you know, harmonized and have been proven by an official uh, institute or government, could be very helpful for us. So another example for qualification of data. Well, the very last one, obviously, mentioned by, I guess, uh, very many people today already, um, by Mr. Kies and Mr. Altman, uh, Altmaier as well, is obviously uh, cybersecurity. Uh, you and I know uh, it's very uh, easy to manipulate data as well as software, so that is one of the crucial parts we need to definitely take care of as well. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Abendroth. Um, very interesting. I'd now like to uh, introduce, uh, and we're going to jump ahead a little bit in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the queue here, I'd like to introduce uh, Karina Röllich. Uh, you are the founder and CEO of Web Data Solutions, uh, which is now, I think, one of the fastest uh, growing uh, German startups, and also has uh, just recently released the market analysis uh, software, Blackbee. Karina, you have the floor. Yeah, that's correct. Thanks for the introduction. So, we are a spin-off of the University of Leipzig and it's all about data, what we are doing. So we, we collect um, online, um, globally, data about um, prices and product offers from um, online marketplaces and um, retailers. And uh, for us, it's, it's really relevant um, what, what we are allowed to do with. So uh, first of all, for us, um, all the regulations uh, with the internet, all things that um, doesn't allow us to, to extract um, product information um, from the web, like images or um, data descriptions, product descriptions. This is uh, everything what, what maybe could um, bring us in, in trouble with our business model. So for us, it would be very, very relevant um, to get the same regulations um, as you maybe have in the US or in other States in the world. So there are huge differences um, if you compare this um, with the German law. This is maybe point first. Um, so on the other hand, so as, as we are extracting all these heterogeneous data from global web sources, um, we have a very um, high focus on data quality. So data quality in the end is really key. And uh, what we see that um, even huge companies um, are sometimes struggling with data quality, even with their internal data. So if we bring data together to make analyzes, to realize maybe in the end um, artificial in intelligence solutions, so we need to make sure that we can trust on the data we get and uh, that our clients in the end can also rely on these data. And uh, what we also see is uh, what data is stored in different um, resources or platforms or databases. And um, 
to, to realize um, global um, data-driven businesses, you need to bring all this data together, normalize it and enhance it maybe with more relevant information and to make sure that it's always um, available and uh, that's directly usable. Um, and um, yeah, for, for us, um, the, the main point um, uh, with the internet is, is, is on, on, on the other hand, this is really, really a huge um, opportunity to use the data there and um, to make it useful and to, to bring it in the end to, to solutions which can help um, people. Maybe yeah, in our kind it's an, an easy kind to make in the end um, good decisions how to um, set your own prices in maybe your own um, store, but it could also help to um, realize which products are maybe sustainable or not. So there are lots of um, more business cases behind these data we are collecting today. And yeah, I really hope that um, we, we, we can um, create a world where data is available and it's, it's useful for everyone in the end. Thank you so much. Uh, that was short and sweet and, and, and to the point. Um, I now turn to uh, Henri Vadier, who is the French ambassador for digital affairs, uh, one of, us, I think, seven uh, thematic ambassadors in the French uh, Foreign Service. You're also a former entrepreneur, a digital specialist with experience across the private and public sector. And I, I just noticed that I, I forgot to introduce myself earlier. Uh, and I, and I, I think the, the easy way to do it is by saying that when, when Henri and I met earlier today uh, and we talked about some, some negotiations we, we were both involved in, he said, well, I've been a tech guy all my life. I've only done this diplomatic stuff for a year. And I said to Henri, but, but for me, it's the, exactly the opposite. I've been a diplomat all my life. I've only done this tech stuff for a year. Uh, so I was also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, li uh, like you are now, in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs for 25 years before taking up these positions as, as a Deputy Secretary General. Uh, enough about me. Uh, Henri, you have the floor. Thank you for five minutes, uh, four minutes. And I will leave after, before the end of the conference. So good morning. But not before the end of the four minutes, I hope. <laughs> so. Good morning, I'm very happy to share some ideas with you. I, yes, I was also the first chief data officer of the French government, and I share four ideas. The main idea is that we have to face the fact that, th think about this, through history, the main, the greatest disruption have occurred when a scarce resource became abundant. It was the case for food and agriculture, for printing and knowledge, for uh, industrial revolution and energy, and now we have to face the fourth one, it's the data abundance. And we are not prepared to this. Because when we have this kind of revolution, everything changes. The balance of powers change, the value chain change, and the public policies and the role of the state change. And this revolution is not like the former revolution because there is a great difference. It's not, the data is not the new oil. I disagree with your introduction. Because data is an infinite resource. You can use the data and you create more data, not less data. So we have to deal with the uh, abundance revolution with an infinite resource. And that's something very new in human history. And uh, your question this morning is how to create more value in this field. So first, the first answer is quite simple. Uh, we create value when someone uses the data to build something. That's quite simple. And there is a first consequence, is that very often, maybe not every time, but very often, you should share your data, make open government data for governments and share your data, because if you don't, the people will find the data elsewhere and we will organize themselves without you and without your data, and you will be weak and alone uh, somewhere. So, it's not so difficult. If some people use the data, they may create value. Uh, the, the question for government is more where do we create value and for whom? And of course, as government, I think that we have to promote the creation of shared value and to fight for general interest. And for this, maybe it was your question, we will need some regulation sometimes, but I feel that we need more uh, public policies. And we need three very important topics in these public policies, and I, I will be brief. First, we, we need to foster innovation. Because this kind of innovation comes from rich ecosystem with uh, collaboration, creativity, interaction, fair competition. We need research, we need uh, experimentation, we need to be able to create a lot of startups. So we have to foster innovation. 
Then, and that's very important, we need to build robust data infrastructures. We spend a lot of money as government for roads, rail, and a lot of physical infrastructures, and we don't consider enough the data infrastructures. So sometimes we will have to finance and build the infrastructures, but in this field, sometimes it's more efficient to, to cooperate with commons, with OpenStreetMap, with uh, Wikipedia, with, uh, because you, the people, you, you are building very interesting in infrastructures, and the, that has uh, digital commons, that's very important. And of course, uh, last but not least, we need to build trust and accountability into everything we do with data. Most people ha have concern around the misuse of data to oppress and control individuals. They, they have concern with huge monopolies. They have concern with privacy. They are right. You have to face this. You, you have to organize ourselves to avoid this kind of uh, threat with data. So uh, the citizen has the right to have these concerns, and the government has a duty to find solution with you. But uh, that's my three topics. Innovation, infrastructures, and uh, trust and accountability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd now like to turn to uh, uh, Grégoire uh, Kopp. Uh, you are the chief of staff at uh, OVH. Uh, you have a varied background as a former director of communication and spokesperson for Uber France. Uh, and you're also a previous uh, ministerial advisor in the Ministry of Transport. And you also uh, did some time as a lawyer, lobbyist, uh, protecting uh, consumer interests. Uh, Gregoire, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to talk today because, as you said, it's really important to have some room, some area to discuss between diplomats, between entrepreneurs, between politicians, because we need to create internet together. OVH Cloud, it's a cloud company. It's the biggest one in Europe. We are the only European one in the top 10 worldwide. And we were built 20 years ago in France by Octave Claba, a Polish uh, immigrant. So we are European by design. We created the European scale during 10 years between 2000 and 2010. And we did that with very special values because Octave Claba, the founder, is a real tech guy. So for him, open source. Sharing data is very important. And all the commitment of the company is based on that. First of all, the motto of the company since the beginning was innovation is freedom. Because for Octave, it was just natural that innovation can just create freedom. But we discovered and realized a few years ago that it was not always the case. And we changed our motto for innovation for freedom, because we need a special commitment for that. Uh, to answer the question on how we can build a more trustful internet based on data, I think there's just two main points. The first one is reversibility. We need to be able to exchange data. And to do that, we need to create some way to work together now, in Europe, there is a special initiative based on the German government called Gaia-X, and we will work on that because we need to create some links between all companies, and we, we need to be able to host data everywhere to share it with all transparency. And we need to push on standardization too. So my, it's my second point, standard, standardization, because we need to be able to discuss together. It's like to not be able to talk together. And internet is a common thing, so two things, reversibility and standardization. Thank you so much, Gregor. That was short and sweet as well, very much uh, to the point. And, 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 and you actually uh, uh, asked, uh, recommended that we could have more dialogue between the private sector, the multi-stakeholder community and, uh, and uh, ministers. And we actually do have a minister also on the panel, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. So I'd like to introduce uh, Minister Johnny G. Uh, Plate, who's a Minister of Communication and Information in uh, Indonesia. Uh, your portfolio uh, covers uh, many of the main themes of uh, this forum, actually, uh, both uh, cybercrime, data sovereignty, and also information technology. We're very pleased to have you with us, uh, Minister. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Eric. As you just mentioned, I, I, w I was sworn in a month ago, and I have to deal with all this uh, <laughs> informatics. I'm talking about Indonesia only now. As Indonesia aim to become a digital nation, a great emphasis is being placed on improving connectivity across the archipelago through infrastructure, fiber optics, BDS, satellites that connect people from Aceh in the west to Papua in the east. It took 75 years for telephone to reach 100 million users worldwide. But it took Pokemon Go only less than a month to reach the same number 
rapid adoptions of new innovations and technology has been a key consequence of unprecedented cross-border data flows. Data flows have made our country safer, more efficient, and productive. Indonesia enabling of interest access to its entire population lead us to inevitable data governance challenges. As more than 150 million Indonesians now have access to the internet, Indonesia is drawing on a multi-stakeholder approach towards protecting our citizens' data. This approach involves ministries, the national police, tech and telco companies, and civil society. I'll, I will clarify the roles and responsibility of stakeholders with two examples. First, our government will soon complete the general data protection regulations, which is currently being discussed in parliament. These new data regula protection regulations will not only acknowledge data privacy as a basic right of every citizen, it will also guarantee protection of, of consumers' data. Second, Indonesia has launched the largest digital literacy movement in Southeast Asia. The National Movement on Digital Literacy, also named Cybercreasi, is a multi-stakeholder grassroots movement. This movement is made up of businesses, communities, government entities, and academics to engage with and empower communities in data protection, digital literacy, develop curricula, and govern cyberspace. It is taking concerted actions against hoaxes, fake news, and cyberbullying that have become rampant. The two examples il illustrate the key roles of the regulator and regulated. On the one hand, our regulations are giving legal weight to the importance of all stakeholders or to give up to protecting personal data. On the other hand, every citizen must be aware that data privacy is a basic right he or she enjoys. This can only be achieved through strengthening digital literacy. The roles and responsibilities within the multi-stakeholders community are therefore clear. In my view, government institutions must act to protect citizens at all costs, and that includes data. Civil society must educate itself and be educated in schools on data privacy, data privacy rights. The public and the private sectors may collect data, but must do so in accordance with the law. And we are just witnessing the early stages of artificial intelligence, big data, and the Internet of Things. Future innovations will revolutionize daily life as we know it. But only if we follow these principles can we ensure that data protection will be upheld in the wake of new innovations and technologies. We have a long way ahead in answering our long-term digital competitiveness and optimizing our data governance framework. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Uh, next in line is uh, Theresa Swinehart, uh, the uh, Senior Vice President of uh, Multi-Stakeholder Strategy and Strategic Initiatives at ICANN. Uh, and uh, you're also a leading uh, advocate of an open and secure internet, and of course uh, an expert uh, in global internet governance and uh, cooperation. Please. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you very much for having ICANN here. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity. We're one of the many players in the internet space and in the internet ecosystem, and you might ask why we're here on this panel on this topic. Um, it's really about trying to retain an opal, open, stable, secure, interoperable internet. We deal with the coordination of the unique identifier system, the addressing space, IP <laughs> protocol, domain names, um, and IP addressing. And that's really uh, the mechanism on which the platforms run. And so this conversation is very important because there's dependencies between frameworks being looked at around data and frameworks that impact the underlying infrastructure of the internet more generally. So I was really struck by one piece of information that was shared with me in preparing for this. It took 38 years for the radio to reach a market of 50 million users. It took 13 years for the television to reach that same market. But for the internet, it was only four years. And I, I think that really goes to some of the earlier points about the 
the rapid pace of the evolution, but also the cognizant nature of having all players at the table in discussing frameworks that need to be addressed uh, around data and around the, the future regulation or best practices for the internet space. So if we look at the ecosystem more broadly, we heard some other terms earlier around the importance of the trust in the internet, how it works, the security, the stability. And for that, you really need to bring all the players together to have that conversation. There's no single stakeholder. So I think having a panel like this is really quite critical. From our standpoint, it's really informing the discussions that are occurring, the technical nature of the discussions, the potential for unintended consequences around that. And if I can bring one story closer to home for us has been the re recent discussions around uh, the data protection legislation uh, and the GDPR. A well, well-intended legislation and a well-intended effort. Uh, the unintended consequences, though, around that have been seen in areas that are part of the underlying coordination of the infrastructure space and of the domain name space. And so when we talk about what kind of frameworks or regimes are needed, it's really ones that bring all parties together to the table, figure out solutions that are scalable, but also solutions that don't have an unintended consequence for the future of the internet and the benefits that lie ahead. So to put that into context for this panel, thank you. Thank you so much also for your brevity. Um, uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Leonid uh, Todorov. Uh, you're the general manager of the Asia-Pacific Top Level Domain Association. You also uh, served uh, previously as chief of state to the late Russian PM, uh, uh, Yegor Gaidar, and you've also been involved in the creation of the Russian Internet Governance uh, Forum. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll be uh, short. Uh, well, first of all, I represent a huge community of 64 uh, organizations that run uh, national country code top-level domains like DE for Germany or FR for France, but across Asia-Pacific. And as, as you would imagine, the region is huge and uh, so uh, is the diversity uh, uh, within the region uh, because we have huge countries like China or India and very small ones like, for example, a small Pacific island of Niue with just 1,500 uh, residents. Uh, with that, I must say that we face uh, probably uh, the same uh, challenges as uh, anybody else because we live on data. Uh, uh, let's say in contrast to Uber, we don't have any physical infrastructure, but some uh, of our members operate name servers, which is hardware. But in effect, we run registries, which are uh, lists of uh, people or organizations that register domain names which is understandable. And 70% of our members are governments, which is also interesting because uh, then it means that governments are coming to the forefront uh, uh, of uh, the problem. With that, I must say that by and large, my empirical uh, sense is that across the region, there is uh, a huge lack of awareness of uh, the value of data. For example, if you talk to people in certain countries like China, uh, probably you won't be able to make them appreciate the value of uh, data, of personal data, and that they would not be on the same page with you. So uh, that means that uh, for some of our members, quite many of them, uh, data collection and data storage and use uh, is not are not uh, specified in any SLA service level uh, agreements. So and uh, they are mo by and large are left uh, to uh, navigate uh, the way of their own. And remember that no GDPR across uh, uh, Asia Pacific. So uh, there is not that level of. Uh, concerned about uh, the usage of uh, the data. Uh, with that, I must say that as any CCTLD, country code top level domain operator, uh, our members face the same processes, very adverse processes, uh, because governments are really keen to take on this subject. And uh, those are brilliantly put, brilliantly put by uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle. Uh, three things which really concern us. First of all, uh, in reacting sometimes irrationally to the challenge, governments are uh, trying uh, 
hyper jurisdiction, which means that they focus on uh, jurisdictional issues. Secondly, legal plurality. You would imagine how many laws are adopted across the region and worldwide. And thirdly, legal arms race. And uh, we are in the epicenter of that legal arms race, although we operate in each and every uh, jurisdiction across the region. So uh, the uh, uh, remedy is simple, it seems to me, and that is uh, education and awareness raising. UN put it uh, 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 in one of their uh, documents back in 2003, and I see no other remedy, actually. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, we have uh, saved the, the best for last, so I now turn to uh, Monika Wiederholt, uh, Executive Vice President of Airlines Central and Eastern Europe, Amadeus IT Group, but also Chairwoman, or perhaps more importantly Chairwoman, of, uh, of the Managing Board of uh, Amadeus uh, Germany. Uh, Monika, do you want to finish us off? With pleasure, thank you. So um, Amadeus is the leading travel tech company, and as you mentioned, uh, that Half of all the airline passengers supported worldwide flow through our system. That means we are dealing with a lot of transactional and private data. And I think uh, what we are trying to reach here collectively is really organizing the digital world of the future. And uh, that is just amazing in its, the task in itself. Yeah. So what we see is that we have to organize both sides, the data owner side and the data user side. The data owner might be a citizen, a person, a traveler, might be an organization, a company, or government. Both needs, actually, we think, are quite similar. You need to have trust. You want to know what to do with the data, so the owner should be in control of the data. We think that is most important. Be it an individual person, to, to privacy reason, maybe. Be it an organization, more to intellectual property reasons. But the control of the owner of the data is key. Yeah. On the user side, on the other side, uh, we see that the accessibility and the manageability of data is very important and um, this is quite difficult and we heard it earlier in the keynotes that even for smaller, for smaller companies, medium-sized companies, this is really an issue. So what I would like to do to finish is uh, with two examples what we do as a company to address both sides or big pro projects going on, on the owner side and the user side. On the owner side, I would say the, um, in travel, the most burning problem, one of our biggest projects right now, is really trying to create interoperable digital identities. This is something in the new digital world of travel, which is so important for the travel, and it's so difficult to solve because we have all these different uh, national interests, uh, legal environments, etc. So how can we collectively create and incorporate and secure these digital identities of our citizens, of our travelers in the future? And you really think through, close your eyes and dream of this travel of the future. It will be quite different. You, know, you won't queue up at hotel desks, you won't queue up in airports. The travel of today is a really difficult journey and it will be different tomorrow. And digital identity is key to do so. And on the other side, on the usability side, what we do as a company, but, but I think a lot of companies do, is really open up our data. Not the individual ones, of course, but the aggregated ones, the artificial intelligence skills we have, open it up and provide an environment for developers to access it. So even as an individual person, as a startup, you could use these massive data and, and the massive skills behind to create innovation and businesses on top. Uh, but that is to close. Both sides have to be managed. And maybe the last wish I have is really whatever policies we create, uh, we have to create a practical, manageable output for users and for owners. Thank you so much. I think we were, we were uh, due to the lateness of, uh, of the, the proceedings this morning, we were given one minute extra. Uh, ten minutes extra, sorry. It's, uh, it's only nine past one. So there is actually one minute available if any one of the panelists thought there was something that they wanted to react to that others had said. Um, anyone? Perhaps especially, I'm looking at Gregoire, Theresa and Karina, who were particularly brief in their comments. So if you want to, to, to spend a minute with us, please feel free if you have anything. Yeah, maybe one addition. Mm -hmm. um, so as we are spin-off um, from university, so research was always a huge topic for us. 
And if I remember the times where our or my research colleagues tried to um, develop um, something really, really great new stuff, we were always lacking on data. So we, we take too much time to get data, to get access to data. And I would say if we can sol solve this problem, um, all of these research will be done much more efficient and much better. That's maybe the last I would say to this discussion. And I would like to add that there is possibility to do something very concrete. For example, tomorrow we will share with the European Commission the release of the first code of conduct for YAS, Infrastructure as a Service, about reversibility. And it's very concrete engagement that we will be able to promote and to show because we create a group of a working group with many companies, civil society, to get that type of code of conduct. And it's very concrete. It will be engaged in the European uh, area. And we should work on that because we should avoid vendor locking about uh, data is very important. Because if you can't take off your data, if you can't move, if you are stuck somewhere, it's finished for you. So it's really important to do that too. OK, with that, I would like to thank uh, all of you. Uh, it's been a very, very stimulating discussion. I, I, I won't try to summarize this because it's been such a diverse discussion. I put down here digital literacy, awareness, education, standardization, trust, innovation, even freedom, cybersecurity, even cyberbullying. Uh, so you were very disciplined in terms of keeping the time, uh, but it's difficult to be disciplined when it comes to con containing this issue because it really is so diverse. And maybe, maybe that leads to, to two more procedural conclusions. One is that I think it shows the importance of really having this dialogue, as many of you also pointed to, between the political level, business level, private sector, academia and, and civil society. This really has to be a multi-stakeholder uh, endeavor if we are to succeed. And then perhaps secondly, also to move from, from the conceptual or abstract to the more concise and, and, and concrete. That's easier said than done, but I think I, I felt a common uh, wish that we can move in uh, that uh, direction. Uh, just uh, 20 seconds on what we do at the OECD. We will continue with our going digital work. We provide country reviews to, to, to provide targeted uh, uh, policy recommendation for countries. We also have a, a going digital toolkit where we try to assemble best practices when when governments and others confront uh, uh, difficult policy questions. So we promise that we, will, we have listened today and we will continue to stay engaged. We will continue with phase two of our going digital uh, project. And is there a brief... Um, Brief, brief comment. I hope it's to praise the OECD because otherwise I won't allow it. Well, actually, it, it, it was supposed That's to be. That's what I thought. <laughs> All right. Can I? Yeah, sure, of course. All please. right. So I think that OECD is best placed, actually, to a best position to, to do the, the work like this because in the past, you've created amazing alliances and a great dynamic because people, actually, not only people, but governments, were keen to follow the best practices in whatever area, we can uh, uh, mention whatever conventions, right? And uh, they, are, they do so voluntarily in, in that proper understanding that they are joining a club of leading nations uh, that uh, are in pursuit of uh, you know, prosperity and happiness for the mankind, sorry to say that. But seriously, that's a great job and I think that uh, you should just keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. You just improved my talking points uh, to a level that uh, was unimaginable. And I promised that this was uh, improvised and we have not provided fees to any of the panelists. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, I have never encountered such a disciplined group of uh, interesting uh, panelists. So thank you very much for your uh, insights. I'm sorry for the, for the delays. I think we got some a very rich discussion uh, nonetheless. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to you. Should we give the, the panelists a, a round of applause? <laughs>